So uh, it was a pleasure this morning to get up and go running without having to fleece up, uh, which uh, is what I have to still be doing in, uh, in Ohio. Uh, so I'm talking about one of my favorite topics today, which is managing colorectal cancer in the elderly. Uh, it becomes a more important topic to me as I get closer to being counted among them. Uh, so uh, here are my disclosures. And uh, the median age of diagnosis of colorectal cancer is 72. So more than half of the patients that you're going to be seeing in clinical practice are over the age of uh, Medicare eligibility. Uh, and so this is a very real uh, topic of consideration uh, every day in clinics all over the, the country and all over the world. Uh, you know, we occasionally see a young person with colon cancer in their teens or 20s, but the vast majority of what we see are older folks. And here you see uh, data on the incidence of colorectal cancer, uh, and clearly uh, it, uh, it's a steep curve and it doesn't stop uh, as, as long as uh, people's uh, data are being recorded. Uh, so uh, screening uh, recommendations uh, are for starting colonoscopy at age 50 uh, and continuing regularly beyond that. And another relevant point is that when you have an older person in your office, uh, one thing you might say is, well, they're so old that it isn't worth giving them adjuvant chemotherapy if they have a stage 3 colon cancer, because they aren't going to live that long. And I will hope to disprove that uh, logic to you. Here you can see that a healthy 60-year-old, and I'll be 61 in a week, uh, is uh, slated to live around uh, 20 to 25 years. Now that looks good to me. 70-year-olds uh, uh, 10 to 15 years, and even 80-year-olds uh, 8 to 10 years. Uh, and that's relevant uh, because uh, this is a, a meta-analysis group that I'm a part of called the ACCENT group, led by Dan Sargent. What this group has done is collected data from randomized phase three studies from across the world. And we actually have uh, now about 30,000 patients in our database. Uh, who've been enrolled in randomized trials, and that allows us to get insights into population effects of uh, uh, and multiply the power of uh, what we're doing. And here you can see uh, that uh, for colorectal cancer, 67% of people who are destined to recur with a stage three colon cancer will do so in two years, and 75% will recur within three years. So if you're looking at somebody who's 80 years old who has at least a three-year life expectancy, that should probably figure into your decision-making uh, when you're trying to decide, do I get the management chemotherapy or do I not? Now this is a, a telling slide. It's an older slide that comes from ECOG. Uh, it's published in the New England Journal in 1999. But what it shows us uh, is that uh, the database that we have for managing, for making decisions on people who uh, have colorectal cancer and are older is not very uh, robust. And what I mean by that is that older people are under-enrolled in clinical trials. And as a consequence of that, you end up having to extrapolate data to do subset analyses, to do uh, epidemiological and po population-based studies uh, to try and draw your conclusions. And that isn't as robust a way of managing uh, as if you had trials specifically targeted to the elderly. And I'll show you one uh, very good trial that came out of Great Britain called the FOCUS-2 trial. That's one of the few randomized trials targeted mainly at older people. Now, uh, are the old really different than, from the young? And uh, uh, as patients differ, I have my uh, five P's here, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the uh, tumors may differ as well. Uh, and then we may differ in the way we treat them. Uh, uh, because uh, we may say, well, my first, uh, my first goal is to do no harm. I took that uh, oath when I uh, finished medical school. And I'm afraid of hurting people more than helping them uh, by giving chemotherapy. But you could also take the, the opposite approach and say, if we don't operate on them, if we don't give them radiation for rectal cancer, if we don't give them chemotherapy, then we're doing harm. Uh, and so you have to look at it both ways. So what about the physiology of older patients? Uh, well, I, one of the issues is if you give 
a, an older patient a bottle of capecitabine that they have to sit down and take twice a day, do they do it? Uh, you know, you, if you give Folfox, where you're giving intravenous 5 if you, you know where the drug ends up. If you're treating somebody who's older who may forget to take their pills, you really don't know if the regimen that you're prescribing uh, is getting into them. And then once it gets into them, their GI tract physiology may be different. Uh, there's a higher incidence of lactose intolerance in older people. If you look at the uh, bowel wall under the microscope, it looks different than it does in younger people. Uh, our older folks complain more about constipation, so their motility is different. Uh, and all of that can potentially affect uh, drug absorption. Their body composition is different. Uh, in general, they have uh, more fatty tissue, less muscle mass, and less uh, uh, water than when they were younger. And then they may have a, a difference in physiology because their heart and lungs and, and uh, kidneys are not working like they once did uh, when they were younger. And that may affect drug clearance. We also know that bone marrow ages and when it ages, it uh, is not as robust at managing the uh, neutropenia uh, effects uh, that our chemotherapy drugs cause. Uh, and there's also the potential for drugs to interact, something that I think we understand poorly. Uh, and are beginning to understand more as we put patients now on the targeted drugs that affect CYP3A. There's now a big list of drugs that you're not allowed to give your patients because we know that they uh, can affect the metabolism of drugs uh, and that's something that, that we're learning more and more about. Now the other thing that can affect people is if your mobility is limited, you're living alone, uh, you get grade three diarrhea, that can be a life threatening event for an older person. Uh, and uh, there's no one there to, to nag them to, to drink fluids and to take their emodium and to do the things that uh, they need to do to optimally combat some of the toxicity that they may be subject to. Uh, and their preferences may be different. You know, when I talk to a 70-year-old about uh, what uh, the benefits are of taking adjuvant therapy for stage two disease, uh, they generally laugh at me when I say, oh, there's a two to 3% benefit from six months of chemo. Uh, you know, they say, you really want me to take six months of chemo for a two to 3% benefit? You talk to a 35 year old mother of three and she says, sign me up. Uh, and uh, so you have to think about what's important in uh, people's minds uh, uh, about that. And, and they may opt for more quality of life than quantity of life. Uh, they also really can value their independence, and if taking uh, treatment can compromise their independence, that may be a vital consideration uh, in their mind. And we argue a lot in colorectal cancer about continuous treatment versus intermittent treatment. Uh, you know, a continuous treatment may squeeze another month or two uh, <coughs> in, in overall survival, but intermittent treatment may uh, really be a choice that older folks uh, want to opt for. Uh, so that you got to be thinking about all these things as you're sitting in the exam room with these patients, uh, trying to decide uh, what's best for them and uh, providing them with the kind of individualized care that they want. Now there are some uh, tools for assessing comorbidities and helping you sit there and say, well, is this a robust 80 year old or is this uh, an 80 year old who isn't very robust? And the Charlson score is one of those things. Uh, and it's highly prognostic because here you can see the actual 10 year survival for people uh, based on where they score uh, in the Charlson score. And you get points for things like uh, heart failure or compromised kidney function. Uh, and it, this would be able to, uh, this is a means of helping you objectify uh, some of the potential estimates of, of life uh, span if you're not factoring in the potential malignancy that we're treating. And then tumors may actually differ, and I'm going to give you a little lesson in tumor biology uh, in colorectal cancer that uh, may help to explain this. This is something that I think we're just beginning to understand. Uh, there are three uh, pathways uh, that lead to colorectal cancer in our current understanding of the disease. There's microsatellite instability, and this is either an inherited or acquired defect and mismatch repair. 
you can think of it as uh, if you were working in Word and your spell check didn't work, uh, you would end up with uh, uh, misspellings uh, in, in your text. Well, misspellings with mismatches of A's and C's and T's and G's and BNA are repaired by a mismatch repair pathway that can be disabled either because of a, an inherited abnormality or an acquired ab abnormality uh, in colorectal cancer and can be one of the predisposing uh, causes of colorectal cancer. Then there's a so-called CPG island methylator phenotype, or SIMP. This is silencing of the mismatch repair uh, pathway due to hypermethylation, and it's much more common in older people. And then there's the chromosomal instability pathway, or so-called laws of, hydro of heterozygosity pathway, uh, that is another common pathway leading to colon cancer. And microsatellite high tumors, the ones with a defective spell check, are much more common uh, uh, lead caused by Lynch syndrome and inherited abnormality in young people, but by hypermethylation through the SIMP pathway in, in uh, older patients. This was a study that we did uh, some years ago using patients from uh, CLGB, uh, which uh, basically showed that uh, this is the, the model for how uh, hypermethylation, these being the methyl groups, uh, silences this promoter gene region, which blocks protein expression and prevents uh, mismatch repair uh, from being effective. And we'll, what we did was characterize 126 colon cancers, looking at the pathway that those colon cancers had toward uh, uh, the development of the disease. And what we found was that 45% of the patients uh, had the so-called chromosomal instability pathway where they lost chunks of DNA and that led to uh, the development of their colon cancer. 55% had this uh, SIMP pathway as relevant. Uh, and of those, about 20% had microsatellite instability. Uh, the vast majority of older patients with microsatellite instability will have that hypermethylation as a silencing of the mismatch repair defect. <coughs> and this was a study that came from the nurse's health study that shows that as people age, uh, the pathway that's most common for uh, development of their colon cancer is that same <coughs> pathway with the hypermethylation. So the cause of colon cancer in older patients, the biology that leads to it may well be different than the biology that leads to it in younger patients. So how does that make a difference in terms of our treatment decisions? Well, it is beginning to make a difference uh, in terms of our treatment decisions. And I'll show you why in the adjuvant setting it's not so much applicable in advanced disease yet. So this is a study uh, looking at deficient mismatch repair as a predictor for lack of benefit from 5-FU chemotherapy. And 5-FU has been our mainstay of uh, treatment for colorectal cancer now for over 60 years. Uh, it doesn't seem to work as well in patients whose tumors arise through this microsatellite instability pathway. And here you can see in patients with proficient MMR, which means uh, they don't have microsatellite instability, uh, when you treat them with adjuvant therapy with 5-FU, uh, there's no real benefit uh, from 5-FU uh, treatment. Uh, and in fact, if you uh, look at the patients who are untreated, they have a better prognosis than patients whose tumors arise from the other pathway. What happens if you treat them? We well, actually make their good prognosis worse. Now, how would chemotherapy possibly <coughs> negatively affect these patients? Well, many uh, of these patients, when you look under the microscope at their tumors, will have a lot of Crohn's-like lymphocytic infiltration. That's the way the pathologist codes it. Uh, and uh, those tumors have a better prognosis. One of the theories is that our 5-FU is targeting the wrong cells in these patients. It's killing the immune cells that are holding the tumor at bay and not killing uh, the tumor cells, which are not as readily affected by uh, this particular uh, DNA poison uh, because of the resistance to uh, the mismatch repair defect. And Frank Sinecrope, who uh, is a colleague that I've worked with at Mayo, 
uh, did this study that showed, well, maybe even there's a difference in those patients with MSI high tumors whose tumors originate from Lynch syndrome versus those who originate uh, from hypermethylation. And what this study shows is that in patients with stage two and three colon cancer whose tumors uh, had microsatellite instability because they inherited it, they had Lynch syndrome, uh, you can see that, uh, that 5FU actually hurt those patients. In patients who had acquired microsatellite instability, there was a modest benefit to 5FU. <coughs> Again, this is a field that's undergoing evolution. It's what we're, we're really hoping to do by understanding the, uh, the genetics and the biology of colon cancer is to be able to say that all colon cancer shouldn't be treated the same way, that we should begin to treat people differently. And when I see a stage two patient with a tumor that is microsatellite high, I tell them they don't want adjuvant therapy. I don't go through a discussion of the pros and cons of it. I just tell them not to take it. So then the question is, is what about the other drugs that we have in our armamentarium? And the main cytotoxics that we have in addition to 5-FU are renotecan and oxaliplatin. And this, again, was a study that we did using uh, patients from CLGB who were randomized to 5-FU lipoborin versus arenotecan 5-FU and lipoborin. All were stage 3 patients. We did microsatellite testing on these patients. And what we found was that there was a borderline advantage to the uh, treatment with arenotecan plus 5-FU over 5-FU alone just in the subset of patients with microsatellite instability in their tumors. Overall, there was no benefit to adding arenotecan. And recently in my practice, I saw a young woman with Lynch syndrome who had been started on adjuvant therapy for stage three disease with Folfox, had, had an anaphylactic reaction to Folfox. It was the first time that I've ever recommended arenotecan for management. This patient had six positive nodes, very high risk, was 33 years old. Uh, and so you can use this in these unusual cases uh, to help give you an edge. Here's the slides that don't show up very well that show the, the curves that show the benefit of arenotecan in these patients. So obviously chemo isn't the only thing that we can do for patients with colon cancer. And uh, what data is there uh, out there about how we should surgically manage these older patients, how we should manage them with radiation. Well, there is some, some data on this. Uh, this is a study from uh, the Netherlands, and of course, uh, the Netherlands and other European countries have centralized cancer care that allows them to essentially track all of the patients uh, with certain diseases in the country. And so this was a study of about uh, 6,500 Dutch patients and what it showed is that as patients aged, mortality related to colorectal cancer increased. Not necessarily surprising, but this is a pretty substantial increase. And are there ways you can influence surgical mortality? Well, one of the ways you can do it is to optimize your patient's health before you take them to the operating room. Another way you can do it is to optimize their post-operative care by being particularly attentive uh, to uh, potential uh, the complications uh, as they develop rather than after they develop. Uh, but there is also some data that suggests that minimally invasive surgery, laparoscopic uh, colectomy, is a particularly good tool to use in these older patients. So this is data from another National Health Service uh, oriented country, Great Britain. They looked at uh, 30,000 patients over the age of 75. They excluded emergency procedures because those patients who are operated on emergency in an emergency setting have a higher mortality. Uh, of these uh, 30,000 patients, there were 3% uh, that had laparoscopic procedures, and the mortality was 5% versus 3% for laparoscopic. So uh, I think whenever possible in the older patients, minimally invasive therapy is better than more invasive therapy. Uh, not a rocket science conclusion, but here's some data that uh, suggests that uh, that makes sense. The other thing that I think was fascinating about this is it matters who your surgeon is and which hospital you go to. You know, some of the hospitals had a 0% mortality, some of them had a 14% mortality. Uh, so uh, in addition to choosing the procedure, you want to choose a guy who's, or a woman who's doing the procedure carefully. 
What about liver resection? Well, I, when I first started in oncology 30 years ago, liver resection was not something we even really considered. Now it's being done more and more commonly, particularly for the subset of patients, people with colorectal cancer who may have one or two or three limited metastases, uh, and with those uh, can be resected. But the question is, is there a time when people are too old to have that resection done? Uh, and this is data from Rene Adam uh, from Paris. Uh, this is a registry of uh, liver surgeons uh, throughout Europe, and about 7,700 cases uh, who were operated, uh, and about a, a fifth of them were people over the age of 70. Now, it was interesting that in 1990, only 6% were over the age of 70, and then as surgeons became more comfortable with liver resection as techniques such as uh, uh, using the uh, CUSA, the ultrasound for cautery in liver surgery, became more widely accepted. 25% uh, of patients uh, were over the age of 70. And, and here you can see that some patients, so even over the age of 80, were taken to liver resection if they were fit and uh, wanted aggressive therapy. Here you see the perioperative mortality. Uh, so more patients died if they were older. Uh, they had more, more morbidity, but not a lot more morbidity. And if you got through the initial surgery, you still had a 60% uh, 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 three or overall survival, uh, whether you were old or young. Uh, and certainly the median overall survival for people who had liver resection was far better than what we can deliver to them even with our best chemotherapy regimens. So this is an argument for not writing older patients off uh, if they have uh, disease that can appropriately be managed surgically. Here you see overall survival. Uh, if they had uh, more than three lesions, uh, if they had synchronous disease, if they got perioperative uh, chemo, and uh, the, uh, the notion was that uh, even the older patient can benefit, although beating them up with preoperative chemo uh, seemed to make them worse. So I would say if you're trying to, if you're on the fence of should I give pre-op chemo before liver surgery from my older patient, uh, this is a, a place where we often will try and take them to surgery first. So what are the conclusions here? Uh, no survival difference uh, between those who did or did not have preoperative chemo. Morbidity was higher for the preoperative chemo, and post-op chemo did seem to be more helpful. What about radiation? Well, radiation, you would say, oh, it's a localized treatment. It's uh, time limited. It's really not going to affect their overall outcomes, uh, but it can. Uh, and here's some data that shows that. Uh, this is a group of uh, 22 randomized thought trials that were uh, subject to meta-analysis. Patients got pre-op chemo uh, in 14 of the studies and post-op chemo uh, in eight of them. Uh, here are the outcomes. Uh, if you look at uh, the overall survival with surgery versus surgery plus RT for uh, uh, rectal cancer, uh, the overall survival was not much different but more patients uh, died of, uh, of rectal cancer if they did not get RT. Uh, and uh, pre-op uh, RT seemed to be better than uh, post-op. Here are the oldest old people over the age of 75. You can see that if they got RT uh, in addition to surgery versus RT alone, fewer of them were uh, dead of rectal cancer particularly in people that have local recurrence of rectal cancer, it's a miserable way to go. Uh, those patients have difficulty with urination, defecation, pain because of infiltration of the sacral plexus, and, and they often have very difficult ends. Uh, now here's data from uh, the landmark Dutch uh, total mesal rectal excision study that was done. This was a study where all patients being treated for rectal cancer in the Netherlands were treated in centers. The surgeons who were doing this were trained by a single Japanese surgeon who had pioneered total mesorectal excision in uh, Japan, so they, they had been schooled by the same teacher, uh, giving uh, some sense that the uh, operations that were being done were standardized. Uh, all these patients got the so-called short course of radiation that's commonly done in Europe, 
that is five treatments over five days rather than our typical uh, five to six weeks of treatment that we do preoperatively here. And they looked at the subset of uh, 1,300 patients who are older than the age of 75. And here again, you can see that the older patients didn't survive as well as uh, the younger patients did, but they still uh, had reasonably good outcomes. They got sphincter sparing in many cases. They had a higher one-month death rate, again, arguing for vigilant follow-up of patients if you're gonna do this. Uh, but their outcomes, again, were better with surgery plus RT than surgery alone, um, a lower rate of uh, local failure, which is also important. So the conclusions from this uh, Dutch study was that older patients benefited from RT and surgery as do younger patients. They have a significantly higher uh, complication rate and early death rate, so you need to be uh, keying those patients up by optimizing their health before they go to surgery and then managing them carefully uh, in the post-operative period. Uh, but if their life expectancy exceeds a year, then I would strongly consider the combined modality approach in these patients. What about uh, chemotherapy and biologics? Well, there is some data that helps us um, in thinking about how to manage patients with chemotherapy and biologics in uh, the adjuvant and advanced disease settings, and I'll review that for you now. Here are our uh, active drugs that are available uh, uh, in this setting, and there are differences in tolerance that we know from uh, studies uh, on this, in this circumstance. So uh, back in 1990, based on work that we did at the Mayo Clinic when I was there, there was a consensus recommendation that 5-FU should be the standard of care uh, for patients with stage 3 colon cancer regardless of age. And the data was based on 50-50 uh, odds of survival for stage three patients after surgery alone. Uh, if five of you and leucoborin was given, you cured an additional 18 out of every 100 patients that were given the chemotherapy. And by adding full fox, you got up to uh, essentially uh, two thirds of patients, or three quarters of patients surviving, uh, as opposed to 50% surviving with surgery alone. So I, when I was at Mayo, we did a pooled analysis of uh, patients who were randomized to no treatment versus treatment. This would not be a, an appropriate treatment in today's world, but uh, in the beginning of uh, the story on adjuvant therapy and colon cancer, the trials were treatment versus control. Uh, and we obtained uh, individual patient data on all of the trials that we could. Uh, and then analyze them to look at outcomes uh, for under and over 70 year olds. And what we essentially found was that there is a benefit to treating these patients with 5-FU that uh, carried on regardless of age. Now, not surprisingly, at eight years, these curves started to converge and we believe that that was because of deaths from other causes. Uh, but I guess you could argue that success in managing a patient with uh, stage three colon cancer is that you cure them and make them eligible for deaths from other causes. Uh, here you can see time to recurrence in these patients and there was no difference in time to recurrence regardless of age. Now the Mosaic trial is one of our landmark trials in uh, adjuvant therapy of colorectal managed by my uh, friend and uh, fishing buddy, Avery de Gramont. Uh, from Paris, <coughs> who uh, randomized patients to full FOX versus 5-FU. I apologize, you can't see the colors on this graph, but the, the yellow line uh, is uh, the full FOX line for patients older, under the age of 70, the blue line 5-FU. The lines are essentially the same, uh, with the same separation for those who are over the age of 70. <laughs> So that was the finding in this study. Uh, this again is a, a study from the ACCENT group, this meta-analysis group that I'm part of, that looked at patients, uh, 12,500 patients with stage two and three colon cancer. Two of the studies, the MOSAIC trial and NSABP CO7, uh, used oxaliplatin-based regimens, so I'm gonna focus on those. And what this study showed actually is that patients over the age of 70 seem to have an adverse effect 
from being treated with oxaliplatin. And so th this really raised a lot of questions about how aggressive should we be uh, in these stage three patients. And in trying to understand why this happened, uh, one of the issues related to deaths within six months of treatment. And it, here you can see that the uh, death rate within six months of treatment, uh, if you got oxaliplatin, was more than twice the death rate uh, if you got just 5-FU. And so uh, this study led to questioning of the value of oxaliplatin in older patients uh, with stage 3 colon cancer. <coughs> And here you can see what's called a step analysis where at the age of 70, the benefit of adding the extra drug seemed to drop off. Now, uh, the De Gramont group then looked at uh, their subset of elderly patients in the Mosaic trial. And what they showed was that disease-free survival for patients greater than 70 uh, seemed to be very similar to that of patients under the age of 70 and still uh, uh, showed an advantage to taking Fulfox over just 5-FU. But overall survival did not. And so Amory asked the question, why would this be? Uh, if, if the disease-free survival looks good, what, what's causing patients to die by five years? Uh, and what he showed was that uh, overall survival after recurrence was poorer in these patients. And so the theory was that oncologists were choosing not to manage these patients as aggressively after recurrence. And it was that that really led to this fall off, not the, uh, the lack of benefit of Fulbox in these older patients. And so it was related to management of relapse, not so much manage, uh, uh, avoidance of relapse. Now the other big trial that was out there looking at a 5-FU oxaliplatin regimen was this one that Dan Haller lab led, which uh, looked at capecitabine plus oxaliplatin versus 5-FU lupivorin. And, and so uh, it's 5-FU uh, versus 5-FU plus ox, <coughs> essentially. Uh, and they looked at the disease-free survival. Uh, statistically, these uh, two regimens were equivalent. All those LX came out slightly on top. Uh, here's the overall survival data showing, again, about 75% of patients surviving five years uh, with this treatment. And then they looked at patients older than, and younger than 65 and older and younger than 70, showing a continued benefit uh, to uh, uh, the oxaliplatin-containing regimens over the 5-FU-containing regimens in these patients. Uh, and in the 70-year-old patients, it was marginal, but it was still present. Uh, if you compare this to the accent analysis, uh, this uh, study did show some modest benefit compared to Fulfox. They also looked at uh, Toxicity and the toxicities that were worse were principally diarrhea, more common in the older patients, uh, but it was also more common with 5 of you alone and nausea and vomiting, so it was essentially GI toxicity. But their conclusion was Zellox is a good regimen in older patients. So now let's look at some epidemiologic studies. You remember I said to you that because we have little direct data in older patients, uh, often we have to look to uh, uh, large databases to draw some conclusions. Uh, and this is a study uh, in, of adjuvant therapy for stage three patients in the oldest elderly. Uh, so uh, what you see here is that in, in, these, in this California cancer registry uh, evaluation, a third of patients were 75 to 85 and 13% uh, were greater than 85. This was just looking at what doctors did for these patients. It wasn't that these patients were randomized to a particular uh, uh, treatment approach. But what they found was that of these older people, 51% did receive chemotherapy for stage three disease. The five-year survival, 55% versus 43% uh, if they were treated versus not treated. And 11% of patients over the age of 85 still had a modest uh, uh, survival benefit if they were treated. Here's another study from the Netherlands looking at uh, increased adjuvant treatment and improved survival in elderly stage three patients. 8,000 patients in 
in uh, the years 97 to 2000, only 12% uh, of those over the age of 75 were uh, given treatment as doctors got more comfortable with managing the toxicity and treating older people. Fully a third got uh, adjuvant therapy uh, in the years 2007 through 9, and there was about a 7% advantage uh, in survival uh, to getting treatment, and 60% of these patients died of their disease. Here's a study that we did looking at uh, SEER registries in people, people over the age of 75. <coughs> Uh, and what we showed was that chemotherapy use varied across cohorts. It was interesting in that 46% uh, of people were treated if treated by community docs, but if they were treated at NCCN academic institutions, 75% were treated. So academic docs are more comfortable treating these older patients, at least in this uh, database. And there still was an oxalic uh, platinum treatment association uh, uh, with 3% benefit in overall survival. Here's another study that we did that looked at uh, adverse events. Uh, and what this study did was uh, look at about uh, almost 30,000 patients who were over the age of 75. Uh, and, uh, and what we showed was that uh, there were no more ER visits, hospitalizations, or death in the older versus younger patients, although there was a higher rate of serious adverse events. So what, did, what do you do with your stage three older patients? Well, what I recommend is that you want to assess their comorbidities using something like the Charlson Index uh, and optimize their comorbidities. Watch them carefully. Uh, you want to estimate their remaining lifespan if they've got uh, heart failure and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and you guess that their estimated lifespan is a year or two, uh, you may want to use that uh, in factoring in how aggressive you are in treating them. Uh, if they, you see them uh, before they have surgery for their colon cancer, send them to a laparoscopic surgeon who's a good surgeon. Uh, and I, if you have patients with stage three uh, who are older, I, you know, it still is true that 5FU provides a lion's share of the benefit in stage 3 colon cancer treatment. Uh, and you need to make an individualized decision whether you want to give somebody 5FU plus oxaliflatin or 5FU alone. Now, if you give infusional 5FU through the 48-hour approach that's part of the full fox regimen, the toxicity in that treatment is really very modest. The biggest toxicity is having to carry a pump around for two days out of every two weeks because most people really don't have a lot of side effects with that. Uh, and often, if I'm worried about somebody, I'll start with that, and if they tolerate it well, then we'll dial in some oxaliplatin if they do want to be aggressive. Okay, what about uh, advanced disease? Well, this is a study that we published a while back in 2006 that was an analysis of five different trials uh, looking at full fox versus other regimens. Uh, two of the studies were for advanced disease, including about 500 patients. Here you see the difference between patients less than 70 and patients older than 70. This was in the adjuvant <coughs> setting. Uh, this was in the advanced disease setting. It shows that uh, uh, disease-free survival with full fox uh, was better than that of 5FU, uh, just whether you were older or younger than 70. This is the uh, FOCUS-2 study that I talked to you about, which I think is an exceedingly well-designed uh, experiment. Uh, one of the few randomized trials specifically uh, targeted at older individuals, uh, done by Matt Seymour and colleagues uh, through uh, the uh, British uh, system published in Lancet. So here was what the study looked at. It said, okay, well, what about just the simplest regimen, just 5 of you and look in older patients and frail patients, versus full fox, versus cytobine, which many call a kinder and gentler form of 5 of you because you can take it as a pill, or cytobine and oxaliplatin. The other thing that I think that these investigators did that was shrewd was they didn't start with the 100% dose of uh, these regimens that we commonly do. They said, let's start at 80% dose. We'll do a chemo tolerance test in our patients. If they tolerate chemo, then we'll escalate it. Uh, but we won't knock them down so that they never get up again uh, by uh, giving them full dose treatment initially. 
And this was a group of people that were median age of 74. Uh, only a minority of them were fully functional with a performance score of zero. And so this is more often what you see in our patients. Now, the PS2 may be because they've got degenerative joint disease and have to walk with a cane. I, that really has very little relationship to their cancer, but it's the way our older population often uh, is. Now the interesting thing was that only about a third of patients per protocol got dose escalation. So starting at 80% dose actually turned out to be a shrewd uh, strategy in this particular group of patients. And fully half of patients had to have a dose reduction even from the 80% dose. Uh, full doses were delivered in only 14% of patients after they'd been on treatment uh, for three months. So, you know, one of the mistakes that we make is, uh, is developing our drug regimens in 40-year-olds in and then just handing them over to 80-year-olds without thinking about it. And I think this study helped us to understand that better. Now, the interesting thing was that if you look at outcomes, uh, and these are the outcome slides, uh, there was not a great benefit to two drugs over one drug. All right, and I'll show you the, some of the uh, data here. Here you see the response rate was much higher with two drugs versus one drug. The progression-free survival was better by two months here, but capecitabine and K-box had very similar progression-free survival. And in this group of older, sicker patients, the median overall survival was less than what we would expect of we're now expecting a median survival in excess of two years for people with advanced disease. But remember, this was a group that was sicker by design. Uh, that's who was enrolled in the study. Uh, there was actually higher toxicity with Cape Cytobine than with 5-FU. As, as you remember, I, I said that many people consider Cape Cytobine the kinder and, and gentler 5-FU. That isn't the case here, and that's been my bias uh, from my experience in practice. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that Cape Cytobine does have some uh, 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 renal excretion and renal function is often compromised in these patients, but it's difficult to tell just how compromised it is. There was no difference in quality of life for 5-FU versus Cape. They did a, a, an assessment where they asked the patients, how was this? Uh, they called it overall treatment utility, or OTU. Both the patient and the doctor assessed whether the treatment was worthwhile. And it was interesting that the receipt of oxaliplatin was strongly associated with better uh, uh, OTU on the part of both the physicians and the patients. So even though the data wasn't strikingly in favor of oxaliplatin, uh, both the docs and the patients thought that they'd rather either give or take oxaliplatin-associated regimen with this study. Now what about arenotecan? Well, it's not generally used in the adjuvant setting, but in metastatic disease, uh, data suggests similar uh, tolerance. This is a study we did back in 2008 that looked at 5-FU versus arenotecan regimen. Much higher response rates with arenotecan, statistically significantly better progression-free and overall survival. Uh, this is in the patients younger than 70, similar findings in the patients older than 70. What about bevacizumab? Well, we worry about bevacizumab sometimes in our older patients because it can exacerbate hypertension. Uh, it uh, is associated with a higher risk of arterial thrombotic events. Uh, how does it do? Well, there were two studies that looked at arena TCAM5 a few with or without bevacizumab. Uh, one was her Hurwitz study, the other uh, uh, Kabinabar's study, uh, the data was pooled in this particular analysis, uh, and essentially what it showed was that uh, the, uh, in older patients and in all patients, the effects were similar. So I'm going to pull, uh, pull your attention to this particular data that shows that 5-FU uh, or renotecan 5-FU without bevacizumab led to about a 13-month median overall survival. If you added them, it added about six months to it, which is a significant uh, benefit. Uh, and if you uh, compare that to all patients, uh, uh, the benefit in older patients was similar. What about uh, more modern regimens of using a, a infusional 5-FU? Uh, here you see, uh, again, a similar benefit 
uh, for the older seven, than 70 uh, group uh, with a better outcome. What about cetuximab? Cetuximab is one of our monoclonal antibodies. It's associated uh, uh, with rash as well as fatigue in patients. Uh, there is some data that suggests that uh, if you add cetuximab to full theory, uh, that you get uh, some better outcomes. Uh, here are some of the data on comorbidities from a randomized study of treatment versus no treatment in an advanced disease setting. Uh, no difference in outcomes whether you were older than, or younger than 65. So uh, in summary, uh, in the advanced disease setting, uh, there's little data to suggest that older patients enrolled on clinical trials derive a benefit that's much different than younger patients with active agents. Obviously, you want to individualize this. You don't want to knock your patients to their knees in the name of uh, giving them a, a month or two or three of uh, increased survival. Uh, in the adjuvant setting, uh, there is a suggestion that there may be a differential benefit, and I'm less likely to push people to take oxaliplatin in the stage three setting now than I was uh, several years ago. Uh, and uh, even the disease-free and time to progression benefits of adding oxaliplatin, if you uh, uh, can disappear with time, Part of that, as I uh, told you, I believe is related to early mortality, uh, which means uh, uh, that I want to remind you again to optimize the uh, medical management of these patients. Uh, I often will see them more often than I'll see my younger patients, just so that if they start to slip, I can reverse that slip uh, without them uh, ending up in the ED and, and in the hospital. So how do you make the best choices? Well. What we need now is more data on tumor biology as a function of age, uh, and there are many, many uh, uh, investigations looking at that. Uh, we really need to revisit the issue of whether to add oxaliplatin to 5-FU. We know 5-FU is far easier to tolerate and provides most of the benefit, uh, and we need to be cognizant of competing causes of death when we're managing our older patients. Uh, and then. Uh, when in doubt, uh, take the approach that the investigators in the FOCUS-2 trial took, that is, start out with a lower dose. Test the chemo tolerance in your patients. Escalate the dose if they're able, uh, but don't knock them to their knees with their first experience because they may never get off their knees uh, and get back to treatment. Uh, and then watch them really carefully. Uh, so those are my points. Uh, that concludes my talk, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.